This is AQA A-Level Chemistry and we are on the thermodynamics topic. This is part four. And in this video, we're going to take a look at entropy and Gibbs free energy. I'm going to recommend you pause as you go and have a go at the activities before looking at the answers. So in terms of um, why chemical reactions take place, We've got two objectives here. I can explain why endothermic reactions occur, and I can explain how a temperature change affects feasibility. The first question here is about the words spontaneous and feasible. Have a think about what they mean to you. It might seem unusual if you're seeing this for the first time, but in chemistry, they mean the same thing. And what they actually mean is that the reactions could take place of their own accord. Doesn't mean they necessarily will. Uh, it might be that activation energy is too much of a barrier, but they could feasibly happen. So to start to think about how and why we can explain that, we need to discuss something called entropy. And first of all, just to have a think about um, headphones here, they've got wires on them. Which of these is what you're most likely to see if you've had them in your pocket for a while? The reality is, it's going to be what we see here at minute 10. They're tangled up, uh, they're tied up in knots. They've not been tied into knots by anybody. It's just happened naturally. Similarly, if we can imagine that a pile of bricks fall off a truck, which of these are they most likely to look like? And, of course, it's more likely to look like the random pile of rubble rather than neatly piled bricks. So this is our introduction to entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness or disorder. And what we're seeing in both of these examples is at minute 10 or after time, we have a much more disordered set of headphones. When we look at the pile of bricks that have fallen, it's far more likely they will be disordered than ordered. And the whole concept of entropy is that entropy is always increasing. So the universe is tending towards greater disorder. Entropy has the symbol S. The change in entropy is delta S, and you'll notice here the units are joules per Kelvin per mole. And that's a really important unit to remember for a variety of reasons that we will discuss later. So let's have a think about how melting ice and then freezing water will increase entropy. Have a think and then see how you do. Well, for melting ice, we're going from a solid to a liquid. So, of course, there is greater disorder. There is greater chaos because the atoms have moved from vibrating around a fixed point to slipping and sliding over each other, moving much more randomly. That's a sign of increased entropy. Freezing water, however, we're going from a liquid to a solid. We're moving towards particles being tightly packed and vibrating around a fixed point. So the entropy in the water has decreased. However, to do that, we've needed to put them into a freezer, perhaps, and that freezer has to be powered by electricity, and that electricity has possibly been formed by burning fuels, which has created carbon dioxide and gases that have gone out into the atmosphere. So although the entropy in the water has decreased, the overall entropy in the universe has still increased. Now, feasibility of a reaction is... <clears throat> based on the enthalpy of a reaction. And exothermic are generally favoured. But it's also about the entropy of the reaction. And because the universe is tending towards greater disorder, it makes sense that reactions are far more likely to happen if entropy is increasing. And we're going to look at that a little bit more later on. So now have a think about these calculations. What state do we think these are in? Well, lots of them, I think, are very, very straightforward. We know that diamond, graphite, copper, and iron are solid. We know that liquid water is a liquid, as is mercury. We know that steam, ammonia, and carbon dioxide are gases. Can we work out the rest? Well, we know that hydrogen chloride is a gas. Don't get that mixed up with hydrochloric acid. That's HCl dissolved in water. But we could assume that it's a gas because it has a very similar entropy value 
to the other gases that surround it. So it makes sense that when you've got this big jump in disorder, we're moving to a much more rapid movement of particles. For the others, well, all of the others are solid. We know that ice is a solid. We know that metal oxides, metal carbonates are solid and also ammonium chloride, which is made up of NH4 plus and Cl minus, which means it's ionic. Ionic compounds are solid at room temperature. So just colour coding there, we can see that all of the solids have got the lowest entropy values, the liquids have higher entropy values, but then the gases have much higher entropy values. So let's have a look at these questions. So what do you notice about the entropy values when considering the structure of the material? Well, we've just talked about this, actually. Higher entropy value means it's a gas. Lower value will mean it's a solid. Somewhere in between makes it a liquid. And which of the three here, solid, liquid or gas, has the greatest entropy? Well, that would be the gas. And that's because there is more random movement of particles, which means there is faster movement of particles and the particles are further apart. All of these things lead you to see that there is a greater level of chaos and disorder, and therefore higher entropy. So we're now going to spend a bit of time doing some entropy calculations, or change in entropy. Change in entropy is the sum of the entropy of the products, take away the sum of the entropy of the reactants. So have a go at these. So for the first one, you can see that I've colour coded it. The product is graphite, which is 5.7. And we're taking away the sum of the entropy of the reactants, which is 2.4. That gives us an entropy value of plus 3.3 joules per Kelvin per mole. The units there are really important. But also we would expect that to be an increase in entropy because diamond has four covalent bonds per carbon. Graphite only has three and then it has delocalized electrons. That's slightly more disordered. The plus is very important. I would always recommend that you put that in. Next one. Well, if you looked at the symbol equation here, it would be one mole of calcium carbonate makes one mole of calcium oxide and one mole of cal carbon dioxide. So you don't need to multiply any of the values. If I do my delta S calculation, you can see the color coding. My 40 plus 214 is my entropy of products. I'm taking away my entropy of reactants, giving me an entropy change of plus 161 joules per Kelvin per mole. We've gone from one mole of solid to one mole of solid and one mole of gas. Of course, it's more disordered. Of course, we would expect an increase in entropy. For the next one, ice going to steam. Well, we take the values direct from the table again. There they are. We are going to find that we've got an entropy change of plus 141 joules per kelvin per mole and once again we've got one mole of h2o as a solid it's becoming one mole of h2o but as a gas so that is much more disordered hence we would expect the positive entropy change onto liquid water going to ice water now so for this one, we've got the numbers there. We're going to put them in and we would expect here the entropy change to be negative. We're going from a liquid to a solid, much more ordered arrangement of the particles. Rapid and random movement of particles moving towards vibrating around a fixed point. So what does it tell us if the entropy change is negative and positive? If the entropy change is negative, it means that entropy has decreased. The products are more ordered than the reactants. Whereas for a positive change, the entropy has increased. The products are less ordered or more disordered than the reactants. 
So that's entropy in very simple terms, but we don't look at that really in isolation. We are going to need to look at the combination of delta H and delta S and also T to calculate a new value, delta G. Delta G is Gibbs free energy. It's really important that you remember this equation, delta G is delta H, take T delta S, and we can see delta G is Gibbs free energy, delta H is the enthalpy change, T is temperature, must be in kelvins, and delta S, which is commonly measured in joules per kelvin per mole. And that's going to be an important consideration when we do these calculations a little later on. This bottom line is also incredibly important. If a reaction is to be feasible, the delta G value must be negative. Just taking a look again here, Gibbs free energy and enthalpy change both have the same units, they're kilojoules per mole. When you calculate an entropy change, it's joules per kelvin per mole. And you might already be thinking about the complications that that will cause to arise. So let's have a think about this calculation. Thermal decomposition of calcium carbonate. You calculated its entropy value earlier. It came out as plus 161 joules per kelvin per mole. Have a go at calculating delta G at 298K. Well, my delta H is plus 178. I'm going to show you now a really common error. See if you made this. Delta G is delta H, take T delta S. So my delta H is 178. I'm taking away my temperature, 298, multiplied by my delta S, 161, which gives me a delta G value of negative 47,800. If you've done that, don't cross it all out and pretend it didn't happen. Highlight it to remind yourself not to make that mistake again. Here's the correct answer for A. Delta G is delta H, take T delta S. I put those figures in exactly as I did earlier, but we have a consideration. Remember that delta S was calculated as 161 joules per kelvin per mole. To put it into delta G, I need to convert it to kilojoules per kelvin per mole. And I do that by dividing by a thousand. That then gives me a delta G value of plus 130 kilojoules per mole. Now, that tells us, because it's positive, that the reaction is not feasible at 298K. Calcium carbonate, chalk, does not break down at standard temperature. Let's have a look at B now. So for B, we've got delta G is delta H take T delta S. Once again, I put all of the figures in. My 178 is my delta H. 161 over 1000, my delta S. This time my temperature is 1500, so I've put that one here. When I do this calculation, I get a value of negative 63.5 kilojoules per mole. Now that tells me that calcium carbonate can thermally decompose. It's feasible that it will thermally decompose at 1500 Kelvin. Now there are a huge, huge number of calculations that are out there on past paper questions. You'll find a thermodynamics playlist on this channel. Go and take a look at those to get some more experience at doing what can actually be quite challenging questions. For now, we're going to take a look at a different type of delta G question. Because we've worked out that it was not feasible at 298K, but it is feasible at 1500K. You might be asked at what temperature it became feasible. And we follow this pattern through. If we know that when delta G is zero or below zero, a reaction becomes feasible, then we can rearrange the equation. We can say naught equals delta H take T delta S, which means that at the point that it becomes feasible, delta H equals T delta S. Divide both sides by delta S, and I get T is delta H over delta S. I can then put the figures in, and it's the same figures we've been using. My enthalpy plus 178, 
My entropy, 161, remembering to divide it by a thousand. And when we do that, we get a temperature value, the temperature at which the reaction becomes feasible, at which delta G equals zero, is 1105 Kelvin. Okay, I've added a little bit of data at the top here. Here's another calculation for you to try. So graphite with oxygen, C plus O2 goes to CO2. And I can then take my delta S and calculate it. That's the sum of the entropy of product to take away the sum of the entropy of reactants. And that gives me an entropy value of plus 3.3. My delta G is therefore delta H, negative 393.5, take away my T, standard temperature, 298, multiplied by my delta S, 3.3. Again, remember, we're dividing it by a 1,000. That gives me a delta G value of negative 394.5 kilojoules per mole. So at 298K we are saying it is feasible for graphite to burn in the presence of oxygen to make carbon dioxide. How does this align with the reality of the reaction? Think about the lead in a pencil, which is obviously graphite. So I've already said here, the reaction is feasible at 298K because delta G is negative. But we know that pencil lead, graphite, doesn't combust at room temperature there must be something else at play. It doesn't mean that it isn't feasible at room temperature, but it does mean that there is a barrier to the reaction taking place. In this case, it's the fact that the activation energy is so high that the reaction would never take place at 298K. Again, I'm gonna recommend you follow this up with lots of questions on Gibbs Free Energy, trying those out and looking at how you can apply the knowledge in this video. For now, that takes us to the end of this topic. Thank you for listening and goodbye.